Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. I'm your host, Kelsey Wilhelm. Our guest tonight is Song Chao Yao, an explorer and educator focused on solving ecological challenges. Initially following a dream to travel to Antarctica, led Yao to set up the nature-inspired school group Wildbound and travel the world helping raise awareness, particularly among the youth, of the importance of biodiversity and the consequences of climate change. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Kelsey. Now, you are very, very passionate about this pursuit, about educating, exploring, and solving these problems. But you were led by, uh, I think, a, a dream to visit Antarctica. Yeah. How did when that come I about? was only nine years old, mm -hmm. I received a set of photographs um, by my mom's colleague, Uncle Lee. Mm -hmm. And back then, there was no documentaries like Frozen World and Frozen Planet. So mm -hmm. I had no access to information such as how is Antarctic look like. Mm -hmm. So those photographs really kindled a dream in me that I, one day I want to be with the penguins and the ice and the seal mm -hmm. that I saw in these photographs. Okay. And you managed to achieve that dream, right? Uh, when, uh, how old were you when you first went to Antarctica? When I first went to Antarctica, I was 25. 25? Yeah. Okay, and you were part of an expedition with other scientists and... Yeah, so later I was part of Homeward Bound, which mm -hmm. is an all-female expedition to Antarctica. Okay, yeah. okay, great. And you were the only... Um, in the first cohort of Homeward Bound, I was the only participant from Asia, only okay. Chinese. Okay, Yeah. And, and now you go back every year? Yeah, now I'm very fortunate that I can lead expeditions to Antarctica every year. Okay. And I've brought other children with me. Why do you choose to go every year? It's such a special place. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really interesting. I have spent three months there before I started Wildbound. Mm -hmm. And first with Homeward Bound, with the expedition that spent 21 days in Antarctica. Wow. And then later I stayed on and I worked as a lecturer and expedition guide on some of the expedition ships to mm -hmm. Antarctica. And just by witnessing how people are interacting with nature there, mm -hmm. with the penguins and with the ice and how inspired people become, mm -hmm. I realized a lot of the things I really cared about before, like environmental challenges and and doing research or doing policy reports. Mm -hmm. I just need to bring people to a place that can really inspire them. So I think it has that power to actually really kindle people's passion and enthusiasm for the environment and this deep connection with nature. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of people being transformed and I want more people, especially young people, to be inspired by that as well. Have you, obviously we're, we're witnessing the, the consequences of climate change currently, have you noticed an actual change in the, in the environment in Antarctica? I mean, you've, you've talked about the calving of the icebergs and have you seen a physical change during the time that you've been going? Yeah, so Antarctica is a massive continent mm -hmm. and the impact of climate change there is uneven. So mm -hmm. some of some parts the ice is expanding mm -hmm. and some parts the ice is really melting fast. Okay. So some of the glaciers that we visit every year and you can see a clear difference that it has been retreating. And scientists who have worked there for decades and have said that really the glaciers have been decreasing at a massive speed. Mm -hmm. And I have seen just year by year, the weather has been quite unpredictable. It's okay. always been difficult, um, but because of temperature rise, there's actually more precipitation. Mm -hmm. So there could be more storms and rains and that actually affect the penguins um, and penguin colonies and their breeding success. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now we've seen some recent reports from uh, groups like the United Nations and mm. that are quite quite shocking. Yeah. Um, and they, I think they gave us a 10-year timeline in which to try and fix this crisis or have it be unfixable. Do you, from the research that you've seen and that you've done, have we already crossed the point of no return? It's really hard to say whether we have crossed the line or the tipping point, mm -hmm. but the trajectory of business as usual is yeah. definitely not looking good. Mm -hmm. So the year 2030 is definitely a very crucial time mm -hmm. where we actually have to cap our emissions and yeah. hopefully before that and way before that. So the earlier we can get to actually um, basically capping our carbon emission as all of humanity, all the countries in the world, the better. And I think all of the predictions right now are saying that the previous predictions were actually too conservative. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think there could be more actions that's happening, maybe not on the governmental level, mm -hmm. um, not all the countries in the world, but a lot on the subnational, on the municipal, on okay. the private, individual, and company level. Mm -hmm. So hopefully 
you know, this emergency, this real call for emergency from the scientists can wake people up and we can all rise together to the challenge. Now, we are seeing, even within Macau itself, we saw that there's, a, there's been a new conscious effort to reduce plastic use. Mm. Uh, what do you say in regards to the weight of responsibility being on the average consumer versus being on the person creating the products. It seems like we're being encouraged to use less plastic and make changes in our own individual carbon footprint, but how much of that responsibility lies on these corporations such as Coca-Cola, which was labeled as the worst plastic polluter? Um, most recently? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we have no time to actually play in blame games right mm -hmm. now. The companies blaming consumers, consumers mm -hmm. blaming governments, and governments blaming companies. Mm -hmm. And we really don't have time for that blame game. Everybody's mm -hmm. got to change. Consumers can say, I never wanted plastic, but you always wanted convenience. And companies deliver that promise through the plastic bottles. And now that we know there's Everywhere you go, pr pretty much you see Coca-Cola, you see a lot of food and beverage companies having their packages, mm -hmm. and they're definitely the industry that needs to change. But I think consumers are also giving them this voice and letting them know that consumers want the change as well. So it's about actually how do we work together and how do we make sure that these voices are heard. And companies can say, yeah, it's not my responsibility, but to actually stay competitive in the future, you have to make these improvements because mm -hmm. We all know that young people today actually care more about ecological causes and they care about whether a company's brand image is not just about serving good drinks, but also serving good drinks with a purpose or with consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that can, technology obviously plays a large role within that, but um, you recently had mentioned that we, we have some of the best technology already with us and we're choosing to chop it down in the case of <laughs> trees. Um, what have you seen specifically within the this year and, and the past few years in terms of the Amazon. Has that gotten any better? Well, so we all know the fire that's been going on in the Amazon mm -hmm. and forest fires in rainforest ha does happen and actually deforestation has been ongoing and there has been some efforts in recent years to actually reverse and to stop and decrease the rate of deforestation. But this year, as we know of the political situation in Brazil, there has been actually more fires than usual. I think there's a 29% increase from previous year. So it is basically Basically, you know, we know that the Amazon is the land of the earth and we know that it serves like really important ecosystem functions, but it is under threat and it's not just about the fire from one year. It is also once it gets to a tipping point of the forest, right now it's a carbon sink, it could actually emit um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay. So we really need to actually work on protecting them, protecting these ecosystem. And yes, I mentioned that nature is the best technology because trees already take in greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And it's already on its own, it's helping to solve the climate crisis. But right now we're focusing on maybe solar panels or the newest electric cars. We're forgetting that nature itself is the best solution mm -hmm. and we're seeing forests decreasing. So we're basically, you know, we're, we have re reduction in our own nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to actually look at nature and learn from it and actually protect and help it do its work. Do you think that people are getting out of touch with nature? I think so, definitely. Just on our drive to here and seeing all the flashy lights and um, we saw the moon coming up, mm -hmm. but it's, you can hardly see any stars. And I think, um, especially children growing up in the city, it's harder and harder for them to actually get in touch with nature. Mm -hmm. Parents sometimes are afraid maybe that nature thinks nature is dirty, to get dirty, to get messy. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have that much time to actually get access to nature and to just like feel lost in the woods mm -hmm. or have the time to explore freely. We have a lot of supervised and organized time for our children and for everyone. Like if you're working a really busy job on the weekend, maybe you just want to relax, but we forget nature is a great place for us to unwind and to relax and to find inspiration for our work. Um, and I think we really, especially in Asia, I think we've always had the connection with nature in our traditional wisdom, mm -hmm. and we need to just find it back. Um, specifically in your time here, you, you showed a slide during a presentation at the International Schools Activist in Residence program in which um, you showed, uh, it seemed like it was a youth and they were appeared to be hugging a block of ice and they were listening to the ice. 
What exactly was going on? Yeah, so that was during one of our expeditions to Antarctica, and we had one student who was hugging a piece of ice and probably whispering a secret to the piece of ice. But also glacial ice are really special if you ever get a chance to go somewhere with glaciers. And we know that glaciers were formed from snowfall from mm -hmm. many, many years ago, thousands and tens of thousands of years ago. When the snow had fell, it also trapped the air inside the ice, so it gets compressed in this glacial ice. So if you're holding a piece of really old ice, the ice is actually pressing the air to actually escape from it. So you hear these like very subtle popping sound, mm -hmm. but if you're really quiet, you can hear it. And I call it the sound of time because it's really, we're literally, we're hearing sound from the air that's 10,000 years old. And that's a very special moment when you're just like having a special time with a piece of nature that is really, really old and much older than all of us and possibly older than human beings. You're doing a lot in terms of various programs and, and various initiatives. Um, and you've mentioned that 2020 is going to be a very key year. What are some of the main things that you're going to be focusing on for 2020? So 2020 is a very special year for the Paris Agreement and mm -hmm. for climate change. But it's also a very special year for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Because in 2020, we're going to decide biodiversity targets for the next 10 years mm -hmm. until the year 2030. And very importantly for China, 2020 is the year where the UN Convention on Biological Diversity is having its conference of parties in Kunming mm -hmm. uh, in China in October. So we're hoping that when this happens, this really special um, high-level environmental conference is taking place in China, that we can get the public engaged and we can get not only governments to care and commit to biodiversity, but also young people, but also companies and schools and teachers and artists and parents and everyone who is not necessarily a politician or a decision maker mm -hmm. to also show that they care about diversity, biodiversity and they know about biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Uh, China itself has been lauded as one of the, the countries which is pushing for green initiatives. You can see it just by the switch in terms of public transportation to e-transportation. Um, would you say that they're leading so far in trying to develop more environmentally friendly policies? Yeah, I think China is the only country I know that has a policy called ecological civilization. Mm -hmm. So it means that, you know, there is this connection with the environment and there's this emphasis on the environment for the couple of years that the Chinese government is really pushing for. Mm -hmm. And I am really happy that there are these policies and these mandates for actually local governments to focus on also environmental goals. Um, and definitely there's a lot of areas and China can still improve because China is really good at getting things down fast. Mm -hmm. But in terms of small details, there's a lot of areas for improvement. But I'm really glad that on the global level that China is willing to take that initiative because it seems like not many countries right now is willing to actually stick it out for the environment. Mm -hmm. there, there seems to be a lot of divisions and debate about what is the priority for different countries. But I think in China, it's quite good that we're aligned and the government is actually pushing on these fronts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, China itself is a very large uh, country with a large population, and it also consumes a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think that that goes in line with its simultaneous push for ecological and biodiversity protection? And does that kind of add fuel to the fire for other nations, such as the United States, who have decided to pull themselves, unfortunately, out of the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their arguments? Yeah. So. I think it's really a necessity that China is focusing on sustainability and the environmental issues mm -hmm. because we do have still the biggest population on the planet and we still have the youngest middle class on the planet mm -hmm. and the people who actually want to own houses and cars and they want to consume as part of their identity. Yeah. So we do have this huge demand that's coming from the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you know so many people um, are lifted out of poverty in the past 40 years mm -hmm. is a remarkable achievement. But at the same time, I think I see now, in especially in urban places, that people are actually wanting to connect with nature. Mm -hmm. And China is actually the third 
most biologically diverse country in the world, only yeah. second to Brazil and Colombia. And mm -hmm. many people don't know that because China has a vast territorial um, and long coastal re, um, area size. Mm -hmm. So basically China has many different species of birds and many different kinds of ecosystem from subarctic to tropical. So there's a lot of potential that China can do. And I think average Chinese citizens can think about the places they can go to explore in China. It's pretty vast from deserts to mountains to mm -hmm. seas, to the oceans. And if we can really protect these places, it's for the sake of Chinese citizens. So perhaps there's a way that we can leapfrog a little bit faster mm -hmm. and not just focusing on material gains, but also focusing on the great spiritual, the emotional, the psychological support, and the cultural values of nature that it's providing. So I think there is a real potential there, mm -hmm. but I agree that China is doing a lot actually all over the world. Mm -hmm. Um, building infrastructure yes. and actually China has a global footprint mm -hmm. and I think that needs to be addressed and I think young people in China also need to be aware and to become responsible mm -hmm. and we need to become responsible consumers because literally you know China is getting fed by all of the world's produce and mm -hmm. we also need to care about our dinner plate and what's happening in every Chinese lifestyle mm -hmm. and that has a direct impact on the earth environment. Speaking of the youth, uh, you've, you make it a point to engage, to bring the youth to these locations, have them be in contact with nature, learn, be scientific about nature. Um, in terms of what you've seen so far globally, how at one point, let's say on a scale of one to 10, are we in terms of educating the youth properly about the importance of biodiversity and the real world impacts of climate change? On a scale of one to 10, how would you place us? If I talk education? about the yeah. entire world, mm -hmm. I would only give it about a five to six. Okay. I think there's a lot more that we can do. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many schools in the world that's actually really pushing this, mm -hmm. but there's also many schools who's really tied up on the metrics and the exams and the yeah. targets and in sending their children into the best universities and getting high tech scores. Mm -hmm. Cause there's a lot of stress yeah. in adults life as well in getting a job in like keeping the economy going. Mm -hmm. And that gets affected also in schools and in terms of children's lives. And we see a child's schedule gets really, really packed with all kinds of activities with mm -hmm. no time to explore on its own. Mm -hmm. And we kind of forget, you know, in 30 years, what kind of world are we living in? We're going to live in a more uncertain world mm -hmm. and maybe we'll have more environmental disasters. And we just need to educate our children so they know how to adapt and equip. And it's not just about hard skills and it's not just about math and science and finances. Yeah. And it actually, math and, math and science and finances can also contribute to sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a gap between what we're learning in schools and what's happening in the real world. And that's where I think our organization, Wildbound, and also Inspire Citizens, uh, who we're working with, mm -hmm. are trying a lot to actually make the learnings relevant to create social impact. Because it's not too early to start in schools. Mm -hmm. Um, mentioning schools, obviously Greta Thunberg with the um, with the school strike for climate uh, movement. Do do you think that that is raising awareness in the right areas? Yeah, so I think it's definitely raising awareness in mm -hmm. the right areas because climate change is kind of climate change is the threat that all of humanity is facing right now, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Greta Thunberg is basically crying out, there's a fire in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, we don't like the way you talk about fire. But you cannot deny that there's a fire that is going on right now. And I think in different cultural settings, different countries, people responded differently to her. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, which is a highly developed and very um, democratic environment, I think the school strikes that's going on and Greta's work, it should be applauded. And I think it has inspired lots of young people. And I know in different countries, people have had different interpretation of Greta's work and the way she does her work. Mm -hmm. But I just want to remind everyone that Greta is part of a youth movement mm -hmm. that's been going on for a very long time. And, you know, we had um, Severin Suzuki speak at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit mm -hmm. about the ozone hole, about chemicals in the air. And we've always had young people who care about the environment who have spoken out. Mm -hmm. And Greta is actually not the first one. And she is also not the most outrageous one either. So, you know, right now, because there's so much on social media 
uh, media attention and we kind of you know, focus a lot on what she's doing, but she's really part of a movement that a lot of people are supporting her. A lot of young people, even if they're not speaking out, they're wondering about what kind of future they're living in. Mm -hmm. uh, you you showed a uh, slide in one of in your presentation, which was, um, and you mentioned something that I had not understood before. Um, Antarctica, which is roughly twice the size of Australia, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it has been prohibited to be mined. Yeah. Uh, it's currently until 2048. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. So currently, it's not allowed for any country to go to Antarctica and mine minerals. Mm -hmm. It actually is a continent that's full of all kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. um, and that ban is until the year 2048. Okay. So basically, we had a 50 year grace period um, and saying that no country is allowed to do anything but peace and science here. Mm -hmm. So no military is allowed in Antarctica and only science and a lot of international science is being done. Mm -hmm. So countries are working together and collaborating on science and no one is allowed to mine minerals. How can that agreement be prolonged? Does that involve the same nations getting together and re-signing the agreement? Yeah, so basically before the year 2048, actually even before 2041, we will need to discuss again as part of the Antarctic Treaty System mm -hmm. and all the countries initially who are proposing or currently who are involved in the, in the negotiation to, dis to, to decide together whether we're going to mine Antarctic in the future. If yes, how, who gets to mine here? Mm -hmm. um, and we generally hope that this place really should be kept forever for future mm -hmm. generations always. And I think many countries actually hold that opinion. But I don't know what kind of world we will have in 30 years time mm -hmm. and actually less than 30 years by the year 2048. Mm -hmm. If we by that time have no other places outside of Antarctica that we can mine the world and we still have this huge demand for resources, mm -hmm. we need new phones and by that time I don't know what new helmets or new ga gadgets, new chips, whatever we need, we might need to mine Antarctica. And it's potentially, we can't stop it. I don't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. But there could be totally another reversal way where we are reusing all the materials we've got. And all of the materials that's on the planet right now, all the plastics, all the metal, is probably enough for us to create new products. Mm -hmm. And we're better with getting into a circular economy. Then there's no discussion that's needed anymore. And then we can keep the ban and we don't have to lift it. Just briefly, unfortunately, we're, we're short on time. Mm. Um, you mentioned that not only the continent itself is important, but the waters surrounding that. Would you mind going into a little bit more? Yeah, detail? so Antarctica is actually a really like special place, right? Because uh, around it, it's, it's almost like a huge island. It's basically a continent and all around it is the ocean and it's mm -hmm. a great southern ocean. So the southern ocean is the coldest ocean on the planet and it's actually a really productive ocean. So we have lots of quail, lots of penguins, lots of whales and seals that really depend on the water around. Mm -hmm. And currently, actually in tw the year 2016, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area was mm -hmm. established to protect a really large part of the ocean around Antarctica. But because the ocean current moves around the continent, that means all the species and all the sea animals and all the fish and even all the birds actually also move around. Mm -hmm. So we cannot protect only one part of the ocean. Mm -hmm. We need a network of marine protected areas all around Antarctica. And that's what a lot of environmental groups have been pushing in recent years. Mm -hmm. And also by the year 2030, a lot of groups are pushing for 30% of the world's ocean should be protected okay. as protection zone. That means no go for fisheries and only science research is allowed. Mm -hmm. And at the time where ocean is becoming more and more visible in the public eye, and it's definitely also going through uh, a lot of difficulties with climate change and plastic solution, it's really important we protect what we haven't yet destroyed, mm -hmm. like the fishery, like the mm -hmm. um, penguins, and like all of the sea life that's around Antarctica. Well, you have a very busy year still ahead of you and a very busy year next year. Thank you very much for being on the show with us. Thank you. That's all from TDM Talk Show for this week. Join us again next week for more. Good night.